substitute. Jerzy Kijowski. Jerzy Kijowski is now attending an important meeting in his new capacity as deputy director of the center. So it was up to me to fill this gap. Unfortunately, I didn't have much time to prepare, so there will be no PowerPoint tricks, etc. It will be just the blackboard and some pictures. Well, this seminar is devoted, it's a tribute to Harry Bateman. Here's, here is Harry Bateman, and you will understand why it's a tribute to him. Harry Bateman was a British mathematical physicist in the best sense of this word. Now very often mathematical physicists are neither mathematical nor physicists, but he was <coughs> the one that was truly a mathematical physicist. He was educated at Cambridge, then he moved as an instructor to Liverpool, then to Manchester, and finally he emigrated to the United States. He was at John Hopkins, and he ended up in Pasadena. That's an interesting story by itself. In Pasadena, he was hired by what was called Throop College. Throop College was a small vocational college that was founded by Mr. Throop. Who was Mr. Throop? He was a politician, businessman, and he was a mayor of Pasadena, a little town close to Los Angeles. Above. Yes. Above. Above and slightly inland. So to speak. Yes. And Throop College, as I already indicated, became one of the best places in the world. That was the MIT of the West Coast, Caltech. And during his stay, it went through this small vocational school to become Caltech. Now, this is what Murnaghan, another British mathematician who was a student of Bateman, said about Bateman. His memory was phenomenal. No matter what stubborn integral or intractable differential equation you showed him, a moment's thought and a reference to the card catalog, that's important, <laughs> never failed to produce something useful. General theories did not seem to have for him the same attraction as the special instance. The only exception to this was his devotion, which marked him as a true disciple of Hamilton to the variational principle. As a master of the special instance, I have not met his equal nor one who approached him. And I do not think that we shall see his like again. Bateman's best work centered around the development of the properties of special functions and the solution of the equations of mathematical physics. His first book, Mathematical Analysis of Electrical and Optical Wave Motion, is unique and characteristic of the man. It will be about this book later. Now, some of you may know a three-volume compendium of special function, and this is the first page of this. This work is dedicated to the memory of her but it is a tribute to the imagination which led him to undertake a project of this magnitude and this scholarly dedication which inspired him to carry it so far toward completion. What was this project? It was called the Matt Bateman Manuscript Project. He started it with his cards. He collected a lot, a lot of information about special functions. And when he prematurely died of heart attack in 46, Caltech decided to call a committee. And that was one of those rare cases where a committee did something useful. Usually, <laughs> committee is created when there is no hope to solve the problem anyway. So the committee that had such distinguished mathematical physicists, Magnus, uh, Erdely, etc., etc., there was a whole group, and they continued to work, and after several years, they completed the Bateman manuscript project, and it's available now in PDF, free from Caltech, and I advise you to Take it because it has a lot of useful information about special functions of all kinds. Now, this is the book. It was published in 
poor client who mentioned that Batman was involved in the giant project during the New Deal. Yes, he was very prolific. He, 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 when he was at John Hopkins, he had John Hopkins, and he had been ahead of the project which offered <laughs> jobs to unemployed mathematicians. <laughs> and uh, this was, the, I believe, the only in the world situation where the public works, which usually means digging yes, the digits, digging the digits, digits, digits was yeah. also <laughs> related to mathematics. Okay, so this is the book, and why this book is important for my talk? It's because of this page in this book. Notice here, where is my stick? Yes, it's here. <laughs> It's much nicer. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is the formula, and I will translate this into modern language in a while, which uh, Bateman introduced saying, it is easy to see that the equations will be satisfied. What equations are satisfied and what is the modern Day of writing this formula. This formula reads as follows. First, let me remind you, I talked about it many, many times, that it's useful to introduce what I call Riemann Zilberstein vector, which is a combination of the real part, which is d divided by 2 epsilon plus imaginary unit i, v divided by 2, of course, mu. So this f has the information about the electric and magnetic field in just one complex vector. Now, this vector satisfies the Maxwell equations, which are now one equation instead of two, and nothing is lost. That is the Maxwell, highly dependent Maxwell equations. Of course, you can also add if you wish. Zero. And this vector f, s, is here. It's called m. Then, and m in this peculiar notation, these are determinant Jacobians. Jacobians. That's the way mathematicians wrote the curl. This is nothing else but the statement that f equals gradient of alpha cross gradient of beta. This is much simpler than to use this notation. And what is the meaning of this equality here? Here the meaning is the following, that grad alpha cross grad beta equals I dt alpha grad beta minus i d t beta cross alpha. Now, it's a great mystery to me. I have some hint, but maybe you can offer me some hints, too. How did Bateman come to this particular representation of the electromagnetic field? What is important about this? electromagnetic field represented in this form. Of course, not every electromagnetic field has this structure, but a very important class of electromagnetic fields do have this representation. These are the so-called null fields, and a null field is the one that satisfies the equation f squared equals zero, or which is equivalent to something that you are familiar with, it's the same as saying that E squared minus B squared plus I E B equals zero, which means that both invariants, uh, I think that should be one here, yeah? both invariants of the electromagnetic field vanish. In those days, these somehow you dropped this epsilon and mu. Yes, yes. This is when epsilon and mu is. 
disregard it. Well, I could put C square yeah. here and C here, and then there is epsilon in front. Well, that's your equation. Okay. Oh, oh, yes, there should be C here. Oh. Yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, in those days, electromagnetic fields that had both invariants equal to zero were considered to be very special. They are special, but not to the extent that it we used to believe them, because people called them electromagnetic waves. Other waves were not electromagnetic waves, but only those. Why was this thought to be so important? For the following reason, which I think is worth mentioning in view of some recent discoveries that were even mentioned in newspapers about photons that travel with the speed less than C. Why these electromagnetic waves were considered special? That's because if you write the pointing vector using f, which has to divide by i, then the following algebra of vectors can be performed here. If you take the square of this, we know what it is. It will be minus because of i. And we will, this will be equal to f squared minus f squared f star squared plus f star dot f squared. That's, that's the formula for the <coughs> algebra. And you notice that if this is zero, if this is the field, which now it's called the null field, then we have the following property, that the pointing vector, call it p squared, is equal to the energy density, because this is the energy d squared plus b squared divided by 2, energy density squared. Now, if you think of the pointing vector as the momentum, and you write the momentum as the energy squared times the velocity squared, then you get the following equality, which means that if this is equal to zero, then the velocity of the wave propagation is c, c squared, of course. Uh, Never mind. Yes, OK. Anyway. In some units, it's one. Most of the time, I will put c equal to one. Uh, so this is a special wave which travels with the speed of light. Most waves travel with the speed less than light, so no wonder that one can see this happening that the waves travel with this electromagnetic waves travel with the speed less than the speed of light if they are not null fields. Okay, that much as a digression here. Now we come to our main point, which is on this report. It took more than 50 years to prove and there is some Polish contribution to this, coming from Andrzej Trautmann. Uh, Hogan, who, who was inspired by the work of Trautmann and Robinson on null geodesics, proved that every null field has this Bateman representation. Now, I mentioned that I have some guess why did Bateman consider this. Yes. Line, yes. yes. Vortex, because from he the was a great specialist from the Bateman representation of the velocity field that comes the velocity, from alpha and beta the coordinates of the vortex line. These are uh, related to uh, Klebsch potential. Klebsch potential. Uh, uh, Vorti is, vorticity is, is hydrodynamics exactly. can be written in, as the same structure yes. with Klebsch yeah. potential. In the case where the velocity so is since some he really these he had these associations. He thought, why don't I try to represent f in this form? Now, where does this equality come from? Because then he said, well, it must satisfy this equation. 
So he calculated the left hand side here, he here, and he noticed that there will be a derivative with respect to t of alpha and beta, and then he concluded that if this equality holds, then Maxwell equations are satisfied. Moreover, if this equality holds, this is the now field. Because if you take the square of this vector and you replace one of the pieces in this square by the right hand side, then you have the product of the vector product times the vector which is always zero. So this is a null field according to Hogan every now field can be represented in this form. Now, where do I come with my seminar here? Well, about a year ago or so, I gave a seminar here about knotted light. And what is this knotted light? Let me first see whether I can show you something nice. Unfortunately, this is not my Excuse me, I would like to have a question. Um, as, as far as I understand, there is no uniqueness in the choice of alpha and B. So no, so no, there is no uniqueness. So, so how, is it how uh, much let, let, let me show you. Well, let, let, uh, I, I wanted to say it later, but uh, since you ask, I will tell you. Shift, now, it, suppose I take instead of alpha, beta, any function of alpha, beta, f, and any function of alpha, beta, g these two functions of alpha beta also have this property as one can check and therefore there is a whole family so of alpha so basically group of the film on, on, on the well in a complex okay. alpha and beta of course are complex so these are uh, now i have something to show you here Let me see whether the connection with the internet works. <coughs> I hope it does. Yes, 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 it does. Why does it? not want to show it in full screen mode. Yes, this is the full screen mode. What is this? This is a very nice presentation of what is called the Hopf vibration. There's a nice term in Polish, rozwuknienie Hopfa. And what do we have here? This is a two-dimensional surface of the sphere. And here you see points on this. And the picture here is happening in three dimensions. So there is a relation invented by Hopf between the surface of the sphere in two dimension, two dimensional sphere, and three dimensional sphere. Now since they have a different dimension, then if you want to make association between the points on this sphere, then there are many points on the three-dimensional sphere and of course it's very hard to visualize three-dimensional sphere but if you make what is called the stereographic projection space or what? Yeah. So uh, I'm confused with what is two-dimensional and three-dimensional in this picture. If I use the stereographic projection, it will be much easier to, because then we can visualize. What is the stereographic projection? That works very nicely for a two-dimensional sphere. We have a sphere which is put on a plane and to each point on the on sphere we associate a point on the two-dimensional plane. This is the stereographic projection. Now stretch your imagination and do it in three dimension. There is a three dimensional sphere and it maps into a three dimensional sphere. But that is already a three dimensional sphere. No, it's a two dimensional. It's so the surface three dimensional is a four dimensional space. 
three-dimensional sphere is an illusion. It's embedded, but it's a three-dimensional yes. okay. manifold. That's what they want. Yes. Okay. So since we know about the stereographic projection, we can think loosely about this hop vibration as a mapping between the two-dimensional plane and three-dimensional space. And Hopf invented, let's, let's play it again, Sam. Ah, that's, 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 that's the guy who invented this, I will go back to, anyway, let's stop this for a moment. You, to explain what this is all about. So we have, from a physicist's point of view, we have the following very simple idea. Imagine that you have a complex field, scalar field in three-dimensional space, a complex field. <coughs> that complex field, let's assume that it is regular at infinity also, because that will make this stereographic projection valid. Now this complex field lives on a two-dimensional space because this is the complex number, so it has the real part and the imaginary part. But it's a function of R. Therefore, one can ask the question, what does this mapping signify? Well, we have one point here on the plane and a lot of points which are simply the points where the field is constant. So we have here some curves which correspond to a single point, not necessarily close, that could be different, but this is the vibration, this is the hop vibration, which is a special case of a scalar field. And Obviously, we have these alpha and beta scalar fields, and this will be how the hop vibration comes into play. So we have the scalar field, and two scalar fields. Each of them defines some hop vibration. So we will now go back to this, which you have already seen, but I will not try to start it again. To each point on the sphere, we have a curve. In case of hop vibration, these curves are circles. They are circles, and they are very interesting circles because they are always interlinked. They are linked so that you cannot separate them without breaking one of these circles. And what we discovered in this joint paper that I already discussed some time ago was that you can get more sophisticated linked knots, not just circles, by going slightly further than Hopf did. And how this is now done? Hopf vibration, simple Hopf vibration, will correspond to certain choice of alpha and beta. And alpha is the following one minus two i a a is the parameter that sets the scale here, how big these circles are, etc. And this is T minus I A minus Z divided by the following r squared, r squared of course means x squared plus y squared plus z squared, r squared minus t minus i a squared. So you see some nice feature here, it looks like the relativistic distance except that it's shifted. Why is it shifted? To make the whole thing analytic. It never vanishes, the denominator, so this is all right. And beta is similarly 2a x minus i y 
divided by the same <coughs> denominator. If you choose this alpha and beta, and then form F from the Bateman construction, you get electromagnetic field, E and B. And if you follow the lines of electric field and magnetic field, you find that they are circles and they are linked circles. Both. Now, because this is a now field, according to Bateman's construction, that means that the field E is always perpendicular to B and they are equal in size. So now, this simple choice, it was discovered a long time ago by Spanish physicist Antonio Ragnada, and that, that was a very interesting observation. He thought of this solution of Maxwell equations as being really something very special. He wanted to discuss the ball lightning in terms of such a model, that since the magnetic lines are interlinked, the ball lightning cannot disappear in a moment. And that is precisely what happens with these constructions. Namely, it turns out that it's fairly easy to produce knots in the electromagnetic field, and I will show you now such cases. For example, this is a nice knot. Here, it's a trefoil knot. This is the knot of the electric line that goes around and closes for a very nice combination. How did I get this particular knot? I take the solution produced here by this formula and add to it the solution which only differs by having A replaced by minus A. And in this way, one can, changing the relative strength of these two waves, one can produce many beautiful knots. Let me show you one of them. Oh, that's the one also. And you can produce such knots at will. What's wrong with these knots which I produce in such a simple manner by taking the superposition. They are not stable. This is the knot which is obtained when t equals zero. When you move now this solution according to Maxwell equations, the knot will disappear. It will become a line which of course never ends because there are no sources of electric field or magnetic field, but this disappears. It is the special property of the solutions that are null solutions that they do not disappear, the knots do not disappear, they're stable. They move, they move in a rather intricate way. Let me show you how they move. This is from our paper about the knots. Huh. The pink line inside, which is hardly seen, uh, yet it, it looks yellow here, is, is the trefoil knot, and this is what happens during the cyclic time evolution. It twists, etc., but it never breaks. Is it always electric? No, it, magnetic is the same. No. It, no, magnetic will be just orthogonal to the each point. It, and it's not expanding? No. Hey, no, no, I mean, you must, it, it, eventually it must expand because eventually every wave. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. In one cycle, but then of course it expands. Okay, so this is the stable knot, stable the knot. The knot. The knot. Yes. It's a wave, so it must go to infinity. Okay, so this is the. Case, how are these knots? Have you ever looked up at the plasma physicists? Oh yes, there are the constructions in the, the, the magnetic fields in the in the magnetic field. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. 
magnetic traps in tokamaks. I mean, they, yeah, yes, because that looks similar like a representation of magnetic field. Lines. That's right, because there is a nice connection. That is why Raniada thought that uh, ball lightning can be explained the because there is a lot of plasma in ball. If you, if you have this magnetic field lines, moreover, trap many it. notions which are used in the description of electromagnetic waves are taken from magnetohydrodynamics, exactly where we have this is very similar structures and stellarators and all that. Okay, so now uh, I should but tell you... Can, can I ask you, I mean, if this wave grows, yes. can you calculate some kind of a R square, right? Sure, the, the, sure. The size of yes, the yes. Does it grow? It, it, it grows with the speed of light. Yes. Because it's because it allowed. Because it allowed. It's allowed. It's allowed. It's allowed. It's allowed. It's allowed. It grows. The, the mean square radius grows. With it. Of course, you should notice that because of this R squared in the denominator, all these solutions of Maxwell equations have finite energy, finite momentum. They are localized in the sense that the reason why I ask is that in magnetohydrodynamics there are these that's called the knots. They are not really knots, but the, the bundles of magnetic fields yes, but that's which that's grow, but the but the rate of growth has a peculiar property that it's proportional to the one over square root of a magnetic field. That, that these are these bone uh, strange solutions. But of course this is a solution in Maxwell equations. So, so they it's only C by it's 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 different. Okay, so how are now the stable knots produced? And that was explained in detail in our paper. Because of this property, you can take any function and to produce complicated knots, it's sufficient to consider the following simple functions. F is equal to alpha to the power of p, and g is equal to beta to the power of q, where p and q are natural numbers which are relatively prime. To get a trefoil, for example, one should take p equals 2 and q equals 3, substitute this into the formula with f and g, so no, this so one, we, this, this, this the one that we started from the top. It's always the same. Uh, it's, it's even it's now called, this solution is even now called the Hopfian. Hopfian is like the Skirmion and like other such objects. Hopf, this is the pure Hopfian and these are knots which are on top of the Hopfian. And, <laughs> and this is what, uh, this is history, this is what we did. Now, the subject of this talk today is spectral analysis of these solutions. Why spectral analysis? Why am I interested in the spectral analysis? Because one would like to create these knotted solutions of Maxwell equations in the laboratory. And there are techniques to do it that uses holograms, and holograms uh, are built if we know the phase relations in the wave. The simplest case, which has already been achieved by many laboratories, is to create a hologram that will produce the so-called Bessel beams. Now, what is a Bessel beam from the spectral point of view? This Bessel beam from the spectral yes, point of view. Yes. Yes. It's a collection of wave vectors of equal length which lie on the surface of the cone. And if you want to produce a Bessel beam with non-zero angular momentum, then you must add a phase e to the IM5 phase. As you move here on the surface of the cone, you multiply each wave by this phase factor and you produce a Bessel beam. It's a very simple structure and that is why Bessel beams are produced. How do you make antennas to do this? What? Not antennas. Well, if you want to send the, the wave. It's directional, yeah. highly directional, that's what you want to say. Yeah. It is, Bessel beam is highly directional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't disperse. Yeah. 
Of course, th this is of something. Of course, one never makes a better deal. Of course, yes. in the whole space. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Uh, because they fall off not, to, yeah. not sufficiently fast. However, th th there is a nice paradox because one would think that if these wave vectors point out outwards, then the wave will disperse. No, yeah. no. because of the interference. Because of the interference of yes, because of the interference, the beam is stable in the z direction, and. and even though at each point the, the point vector points and out. And the proje projection on the symmetry axis is telling what is the velocity of this of this signal, so to say. Yes. If you would imprint the signal on it. Yeah, and of course it's less than C. Of course. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that is the idea that I want to see now what are the spectral properties of these interesting <coughs> knotted solutions. And now there is a nice observation which led me to the discovery of the simple way of describing this whole thing. If you would just do it by brute force, then it looks pretty hopeless. Because look, instead of this formula here, I take alpha to the power of p and beta to the power of q. And even for the trefoil, you get a algebraic expression which is quite complicated and to find this it looks complicated. However, this is the beauty of this Hopf <coughs> concept that makes it easy. And what is the observation, the first observation which I made and which led them to the final formula was the following. Crucial role is played by this denominator. Also notice that at the end I have to split this into the real part and imaginary part and since there is an I in the denominator that makes the formula quite complicated. However, 1 over R squared minus T minus IA squared can be written quite neatly in the following way x plus x minus minus tau plus tau minus what is x plus minus it's x plus minus i y this combination is occurring in physics quite often this is how the transition from cartesian coordinates to angular momentum is performed and tau is a similar expression but this time made of t. It's t minus i a plus minus z. And now notice the form of alpha. Alpha is 1 minus 2 i a tau minus divided by this thing here x plus and x minus minus tau plus Minus, and beta is equal to 2a x minus x plus x minus minus two plus two minus. And this simple observation, these variables are used a lot by relativists. They were for the first time introduced by Newman and Penrose. And, and Many, many relativists use this coordinates very often. And if you have powers, notice what happens. This is quite simple. If I have any power of alpha, it will have always some power of tau in the numeral tau minus and some power of this. And the same for beta. So when I have the following structure, like the one in here, then it will certainly be a certain polynomial with coefficients m and n, and there will be tau minus to the power of m and x minus to the power of n, and the denominator which will again have x plus and minus to some power. M and say l. Okay. This is the general structure of and the sum of these will give me any power of alpha and any power of beta. 
Now notice a very pleasant feature of this here. Because this object here is nothing else but a derivative of my fundamental solution with respect to either co plus or x plus. So what comes about here is the following. I have let me denote the derivatives with respect to x by nabla and those with respect to tau with partial. So I have the derivative plus in, with some power m and the derivative plus here to some power m acting on 1 over x plus x minus minus tau plus tau minus. Now, to complete this whole story, I will do the following. What is x plus x minus minus tau plus tau minus? This is my fundamental solution, the denominator of this. And this object has a very nice spectral representation r squared minus t minus i squared equals d3k 1 over 4 pi and here we have e to the minus a k e to the i kr and there is i believe an extra power of k here in the denominator. One can check this. This is a regular integral because of this damping factor. It, you can easily do it going to spherical coordinates. It's an elementary exercise in integrals. So we do have this representation. If I substitute now here this for my expression, I have a very easy task now to evaluate all derivatives that I want, because every time I evaluate the derivative, it will just, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you didn't correct me, omega t, of course, here. Oh, obviously. I'm probably going too fast and I lost it. There's omega t here, so if I want to calculate my derivatives, I have to bring down under the integral powers of k or, k or omega. So the result will be the following, that at the end I have my full spectral representation. And this omega is up to the factor of c, the same as the length of k. Yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. So I end up with the following observation, that at the end my spectrum looks as follows, d3k over k, and then what I drop down, so if I have the nth derivative and the nth derivative, I will have what may be called L minus to the power of m, and k minus to the power of n, uh, times e to the minus a. K and what is L? L minus is of course Kx minus Iky and K minus is K or omega divided by C square root if you wish K squared X squared plus Ky squared plus Kz squared minus Kz. So <coughs> everything is now. Uh, I'm sorry. It, ah, yes, absolutely. I k r minus i omega d. This is my elementary plane wave, and this is the, there will be some sum with some coefficients depending on the polynomial, but the spectrum is always based on this exponential function with a form factor in front, which tells me which particular knotted weight I want. And now it's up to experimentalists to think of a hologram that will <laughs> induce this structure here, and then every wave can be obtained in this way quite easily. And uh, this also shows some, some 
nice mathematical structure here that this was so simple because these variables natural in relativity came in, in, in this nice way. Uh, now, let me mention the relation with general relativity. Once I have the spectral form, this expression here, the spectral form, I can do the same now for any wave that is similar to electromagnetic waves, like the gravitational wave, in the linear approximation. In, of course, I'm not pretending that I solved the problem of strong gravitational waves, but for weak waves, they're like electromagnetic waves, except that they have helicity 2 instead of helicity 1. So what will be the gravitational waves with knotted structure? It will have the same spectral form, except, of course, that it will not be built from F fields, but you need the linearized version of the Riemann tensor replacing F, which would mean the following. I can now arrange the formula and show you where this difference will come from. F the solution of Maxwell equations, any solution, can of course be represented as a collection of plane waves. So we have e to the i k r minus i omega t. And there must be something that gives the vector structure to this object, and this is usually called the polarization vector. Now, of course, you need the second part here, and there is some amplitude here, f of k, if you wish to construct the general solution, then you need also the part that oscillates with plus sign here, so we have e to the i k r minus plus i omega t, and there will be some different amplitude, let's call it f plus, Every solution of Maxwell equations for the f vector has this representation. And if I now want to create a wave with a particular knotted structure, I have to use f in the form which I have already calculated before. And the transition from f to the Riemann tensor will only <coughs> consist in replacing the polarization vector of the electromagnetic wave with the polarization tensor now of the Riemann tensor. Riemann tensor is four indices. It's anti-symmetric in the first pair and the second pair. So this is like two electromagnetic fields. So one can guess that this will lead to something like the, 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 the external product of two polarization vectors, that this all becomes even simpler when one uses this binaural representation, then the transition from gravity to here is almost self-evident. Anyhow, we have now a family of fields, and each of them can have the same knotted structure, it would not have been easy because there is no counterpart for the Bateman construction for the Riemann tensor. So I could not go this way, but once I establish the spectral representation, I can take the same spectral representation and put it on a different horse. Now it will be Riemann horse or electromagnetic depending on my use. One can even do it for neutrinos that are always particles that propagate with the speed of light, then it, th there will be a polarization that speed up for neutrinos. And I think I will finish 
here, and I hope there will be some question or two. So the solutions you have presented obviously have uh, chirality in them. They also have angular momentum. W which? Uh, I mean these yes, the angular momentum is non zero for the simple option, and of course for not it's the same. The, the, the indication that they have this angular momentum, of course, is the use of this combination, view, which indicates that there is some twist in, in the option. But another thing is that there are higher, obviously. So you might expect that. It's yes. More questions? If you are overwhelmed with all these. I will just repeat, I think there are by Professor Toski, it would be interesting to couple the Maxwell field with, with some kind of plasma to see whether you can create stable knots out of plasma. Yeah, they are. But with the My colleagues <coughs> who participated in our project <coughs> are very much interested in this. They are also interested in hydrodynamics, which is the second part of. Plasma is a combination of hydrodynamics and electromagnetic field. Yes. And, and they wanted to create also not a solution of hydrodynamic equations. The question, of course, the difficult one is that then we come into the realm of nonlinear equations. And that is a completely different and much more complicated problem. For linear things, as you saw, I can easily pass, for example, from Fourier space to the coordinate space. No more questions? Then thank you very much. Can I make a historical comment? Yes, absolutely. Because you mentioned at the beginning that one. Yes. And uh, the person who was very much uh, involved in the Bateman manuscript project was a fellow named Marnagan. Of course, and, then, uh, yeah. and, and, and Marnagan was the one say, uh, who uh, produced the video. Marnigan was, of course, an Irish. Yes, as yeah, I mean, and, and this whole story has some connotation with Poland. That I don't and, know. It, well, it's complicated. The question is that the Ireland obtained independence after the first war, yes. and the first head of state of Ireland, whose title, the only translation into the Slavic language I can find proper, is provident, uh, was uh, a certain fellow named Amon de Valera. And Amon de Valera was a high school teacher of mathematics. He, he started his and life. That is why he created the... And, and it, that is, it, of course, it, how he created that institute and then decided to hire all possible Irish scientists from all over the world, offering uh, fantastic salaries. And the one of the persons who partly joined was the Marnigan. And he wrote a series of books even before the Vetman Manuscript Project, each of them starting with some incredible introduction like to the glory of God and honor of Ireland and so on. And the other uh, mathematician who joined the institute but was he wrote Singh. It, he wrote it, Singh. Yes, of course. Was Singh. Singh. And Singh couldn't stand Marnigan and particularly those introduction to the books. And eventually Singh wrote the book, which had the introduction to J.B. and J.W., who never sold so precious, uh, who never bought so precious as they sold. And then uh, the problem raised, what the hell that is? And eventually Singh confesses that J.B. was the owner of a grocery store on the street where Singh was living in Dublin. And the JW was Johnny Walker. The whiskey. <laughs> the whiskey. <laughs> that was the introduction. And why Poland is involved? Because a person who joined the institute after the war was our <coughs> famous logician Bukashevich. Yes. And uh, he was living on the floor above uh, another important member of the institute, a certain Erwin Schrödinger. Mm -hmm. And there are letters. Mrs. Bukasiewicz wrote to the family in Poland, which are full of stories how he cannot stand <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this, <laughs> as, as <laughs> this little Jew 
who spends all the nights and so forth and so forth and so forth. So that, so that has been, uh, and that of course should be published actually, now in association with Mr. Dojo's. Actually, since you mentioned Singh, Singh was the one who introduced this notion of electromagnetic wave. Yeah. And in his book, of electromagnetic waves meant null solutions to the And that was a remarkable thing that this, uh, that this uh, de Valera, there were two leaders of the countries which had been created essentially after the first war, which have succeeded tremendously. Mm -hmm. That was Ireland, mm -hmm. under the Evan de Valera, a teacher of mathematics, and Turkey. And after, but after was, he was a uh, he, no, he was a general, but uh, okay. he is the author of the first high school textbook of mathematics written in Turkish language. Oh. Because he introduced a modern Turkish language, and in the Atatürk Museum in Ankara, one can see that textbook. So mathematics rules. So uh, if, if uh, uh, that, of course, we can draw the conclusion that we should find a mathematician. I don't see a mathematician among the Or there was one, it was a complete disaster. <laughs> who was a mathematician who discontinued Matura? Matura in mathematics. Yes. Then can I make a, can I make a, 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 a very nasty, very nasty gender like joke? That was not he, that was she. And that, expla and that explains everything. Gender? I think I can Nowadays I can afford to say everything. Tak siedzicie, jak jeszcze jeszcze chcecie.